You may be seated in the name of the Lord. Overcoming your unbelief. Overcoming your unbelief. If I could draw your attention to that verse 23 that I could barely get through reading it. Where Jesus says, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. If you can believe. Can I just start there before I go any further, before I say another word? Can I just stop right there? If you can believe. Can you say that to somebody that's next to you? If you can believe. Can you elbow your neighbor? Are you sitting with somebody? Can you push your child and say, if you can believe? Can you touch your teenager? Danger. Say, if you can believe, can you even put it in the comments? If you can believe those four words, my God, I could preach a sermon just on the four words. If you can believe beyond the all things are possible to the one who believes. Praise God for that. But just those four words, if you can believe. Believe, man. When Jesus said that, he said a mouthful. My God. When Jesus said that, he didn't just say that for them. He said that for us. He said that thinking about us in 2020, April 26, 2020. He thought about us in the middle of this coronavirus, COVID virus. I, he thought of us when he said, if you can believe I need a witness right on that if you can believe those four words just so powerful first word if the the word if is one of the smallest words in the English language and and it is a powerful word it's a contingency word it, it's it's a it's a word that we don't necessarily like today because it's a word that means it's not just up to God. It, 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 it's a word that means that there's, there's a condition that has to be met. Years and years ago when I first started World Overcomers, I did a series, and I'm going to have to do this again. Morgan, I'm going to have to do something like this again, but, but I did a series called That's a Big If. And I had a giant if on stage. That's a big if because we don't necessarily like to talk about the ifs. We just want God and his grace and his mercy to just do it all. But, but Jesus said, yeah, but, but the first word he started with is a contingency word that we all have to be prepared for. And that word is if. If you, if you, not if PA can believe, not if your mom not if your bishop, not if prophetess on Facebook. I'm telling you, boy, there's more ministers on Facebook. Everybody, everybody is a prophetess. Everybody is a everybody. Not, but not can they? Not, if you can believe, because some things are up to you. I know right now you may feel like everything's out of control, but we came to tell you this morning, some things are up to you. Uh, understand, uh, with God on your side, there are some things that are up to you. If you can, that word can there is a, can is a work word. It, he just didn't say if you will believe. He didn't say if you do believe. He said if you can believe, if you're able to believe. Are you able? Anybody able? Are you able? Somebody got to say, anybody able? Are you able? Can you muster? Can, are you at a point where maybe at your lowest place, but can you find your can? can? If you can, not if you do, not if you will, if you can, if you can scrape up mustard seed, if you can believe anything is possible all things are possible to the one that believes believe can you believe that word believe there pistuo i actually don't normally give you the greek but pistuo it means can be persuaded my god can you be persuaded if you can be persuaded if you've been seeing the world one way but if you can be persuaded yeah, you may have this kind of perspective, but can you be persuaded? This may be your view on the world. You may have spent the first 20 years of your life, 18 years of your life, 15 years of your life, 27 years of your life, 31 years, 45 years, 50 years, thinking one way. Can you be persuaded? 
Can you be persuaded? Back in the day, we used to say, there was a choir. I think it was Thomas Woodfield that sang a song that said, I am persuaded, Lord, to love you. I have been changed to bless your name. I am constrained by this great gospel forever to worship you. I am persuaded. I, 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 it's not just I'm convinced. I'm persuaded. I have been persuaded. Can you be persuaded? This is my quest. This is uh, all of what we've done today. The worship and the singing and amazing as it is, it wasn't entertainment. It was water on the ground. Can we soften you up enough for you to be persuaded? Wondering what all of this stuff that's going on and the thing that's happening in the world, not just America, but in the world. Uh, and what, what is the reasoning behind it? Well, can I suggest one of, the, one of the questions is, yeah, has it softened up your ground enough so that you can be persuaded? Can I persuade you? This is my quest. This is this right here. This is my quest. Can I persuade you? Can in 30, will you give me 30, 40 minutes of your time? And can we look at the word of God and can I persuade you? Can I convince you? Can I get you to see something you didn't see before? Can I get you to believe something you didn't believe before? Can you see like me? Can you look at all these empty chairs in here and still see faces and still see people? Can you see something even though you can't see it? And can I persuade you to see something that you don't see? Are you stuck in your perspective or can you be persuaded? I need a witness in the building. Can you be persuaded? My God, that's, that's the question. Can you be convinced of anything? Not, you don't want to be so stuck. And you don't want to be so stubborn. And you don't want to be so impacted and affected by what has happened to you. And what is going on now that can't nobody say nothing to you. Can someone sit down? Can you sit down? Can you face forward? Can somebody speak to you and you end up being persuaded? Can you be persuaded? I was on the phone. Well, you know, I'm, I'm, as a result of all the stuff that's going on, and my wife and I started doing this relationship thing on Monday nights. And so as a result of that, I'm getting all these texts and all these questions, especially through Facebook, on relationships. This one particular man sent me a, que a question on Facebook and asking me about relationships and asking me about him and his girl. And he laid it out. Before I answered it all, I asked him right off the bat, I asked him, do you respect me? Do you respect me? Does your girl respect me? He's like, yeah, I respect you. I, I, I believe my, my girl respects you. I said, I'm, I'm asking because I, what I'm going to say to you is going to challenge your theology. I don't mean, do you respect me? Are we friends? Do you respect me? Are we cool? I mean, do you respect me enough for me to persuade you from seeing something one way and now seeing it another way? Can I challenge your theology? It's like this example. Come on, son. It's like this example that I've been given lately in which I've been talking about these blueberry bushes. I got these blueberry bushes in my house and in my yard, and I've been out here messing around with these blueberry bushes, and I'm trying to get, there's this one bush that I've been trying to get to produce fruit like the other bush. And the other day, I got down, and I just had to get down on my knees. I just had to get into the dirt, and I had to figure out what is going on with this blueberry bush. I got three blueberry bushes. Two of them are popping up blueberries already, trying the little buds. And I got this one over here that is not bearing fruit. So I'm thinking, what? I got, I got down on my knees, and I started digging in. I got my hands down in the dirt. My God, that's, that's what this virus is making us do. It's making us get our hands down in the dirt of what do we actually believe? Pulling out weeds. <laughs> I'm talking to my mama. She said, you got to get them weeds out of there. I started pulling out weeds, and as I started digging in there, I came across something that was in, I, I wanted to show it to y'all. Come on, come in real close. I came across something that was in there. I started digging around, and what had happened was 
the blueberry bush had grown across this thing. So I saw this dead, dry stump of a weed in there, no life on it, but the blueberry bush had grown around it. And I'm, it's taking up all of this space in the soil so that it can't, the blueberry bush can't really grow. And as I started to rock this thing, the blueberry bushes started moving. And I, I thought, my God, I don't want to tear up the blueberry. I don't want to wreck the stuff that's given life trying to pull out the dead thing. And so I had to test to make sure was the blueberry bush strong enough so that I could rock and dig and pull this dead thing out that wasn't really bringing any life? That's my quest right now. There's a whole lot of us. Thank you, son. There's a whole lot of us. We have, even now, we, we've had ministries that the men and women of God who have planted seed and living stuff has grown around dead, dry, religiosity, stuff that we were taught that brings no life, things that we were instructed on, church is dead, don't nobody go there, don't nobody want to listen to it, and it's just in there taking up space in the soil so that the thing that will give life can actually take real root. My God. Can you be persuaded? Can I convince you that maybe you've been taught something that doesn't really bring life? Maybe you were taught something that was based more on the insecurity of that leader than it was on something that really would bless your life. My God, can I dig that out? Or are you going to forever have this thing sitting in the middle of your life and you are unable to really bear any kind of real fruit because I can't and you don't trust nobody enough to get this out of your way my Lord and my God I asked this man I said can I change your theology can I challenge your theology not just do you like me but can I challenge your theology not just oh is it entertaining but can I challenge your theology not just oh I like Pastor Andy but can I tell you that the way that you've been thinking about the thing is wrong can I get you to see that maybe what you've been taught has not been the right way to see it can we admit that there were some things that we were taught that now the results are in. <laughs> the science has been done. Those results are in and it didn't work. How's that working for you? Can we actually be secure enough in our life to pull out the stuff that's dead? I love verse 24. I got to move on. In verse 24, immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. <laughs> there, there it is. There, but there, there's, there's something. There's, there's a truth that I'm trying to communicate to you. It's a reality. I'll throw it on the screens. It's a little difficult for us to accept it. But the truth of the matter is that belief and unbelief exist together. Belief and unbelief exist together. Those of us who were taught, like me, that were taught that if you have faith, you never doubt. Just not true. Just not true. Matter of fact, if you have faith, the doubts really get loud. And what you have to do is you have to confess what you believe over top of what the enemy's trying to tell you. Oh, I wish I had a witness. You got, you, you got to get some word in you so that you can speak the word over top of what the doubts are because in your faith it will be tried. And the fact of the matter is that unbelief has power. We'll never really get where we want to get to if we can admit how powerful unbelief is why I read Mark chapter 6 because in Mark chapter 6 it says that Jesus left there and went to his hometown accompanied by his disciples I read it again and the Sabbath came he's teaching in the synagogue and folks were heard heard him and were amazed in his hometown 
And then folks started asking questions. Who does dude think he is? Where he get this wisdom from? Where he get this power from? Where he get these miracles from? Ain't this, didn't we? Ain't that Jesus? Didn't I wipe his behind? Didn't I? Did you, didn't you change his diaper? Ain't this his mama? Ain't them his sisters? Didn't we just go down there for the barbecue? Did, yeah, did you take his sister out to the movies one time? Who does this guy think he is that he going to come in here and have power? Now here he not going to have no power. They took offense at him. I don't know if you've ever had that. I don't know if anybody's decided to take offense at you because you decided to be more than what they thought you were. Oh, my God. I don't know if that's ever happened to you where you had folk from your hometown, folk that's supposed to love you, folk that's supposed to be on your side, folk that's supposed to be your support, say, oh, so now you done got uh-huh, private school. Done, uh-huh. Oh, so you done gone to college, and now you done got all set up. Oh, uh-huh, so now you done left, and you don't want to drink this water, and, uh-huh, and now you done, uh-huh, Oh, I get it. Okay. Oh, so now you special. Uh huh. That's what's wrong with you. You think you're something. And they're offended at the fact that you decide to be more than what they knew you to be. I need a witness on that one. I know I'm not by myself. They decided to be offended. The nerve of you to think you could tell them something. The nerve of you, I know you got money. I know you graduated from college. I know you own your own home, but I'm your auntie. I know I'm broke. I know I'm on wealth. I know I ain't got no money. I know I ain't never had no man. I know I know about, but who are you? They, they're offended by the fact that you're determined to be more than what you they knew you to be. My God, that ain't even my point. I gotta move on. They're offended. This happened to Jesus. So much so that Jesus had to comment on it. Jesus said, Woo, I tell you, boy, don't go home. Is what he said. He, he said, Man, a prophet was a, a prophet is without honor except in his own town. Man, I can be honored everywhere and get home and get this. I can be honored everywhere and go back to my hometown. And folks say, uh, How you doing, Pastor Andy? I, I, can be, I, I can be respected everywhere and not respected by my own child. I can be. I can be respected everywhere and disrespected by the people closest to me. Verse 5 is the scary verse. We all have to rethink this. In verse 5 it says, he could not do any miracles there. (laughs) Except lay his hands on a few sick folk. Lay your hands on a few sick folk mean deal with something minor or, or maybe he healed a little bit of allergy or maybe somebody had a little eczema maybe somebody had a little bit of a cough or he did a little he did a, he, somebody had a headache he couldn't do any great miracles there except a little bit of stuff and the word says he was amazed at their lack of faith he marveled at their lack of faith. And he decided, I got to go around teaching. He marveled at their unbelief and decided, man, I'm going to have to do some teaching. My God, the, my, my battle is going to be different than what I thought it was. I thought I came in here just to plant some living seed, but I found out I got some roots I got to dig out. My God. <laughs> I thought I came here to bring life in that more abundantly, but I got Pharisees and Sadducees arguing with me over dead roots that are in here that ain't bringing nothing to life. I, I, I thought I was going to be able to just come and speak some life and folk get life But instead, I got dead stuff in here choking out the stuff that would bring life. Jesus is healing everyone, everywhere except here. And it reveals to us a truth that we don't necessarily like to admit. And it's, I'm not trying to offend you, but it's just a fact. And it's something we have to deal with. It is what we see in Mark 6. And in Mark 9, you ready for it? Here it is. The truth is, is that faith is universal, but unbelief is personal. Faith is universal, but unbelief is personal. Since they have a personal relationship with him. 
since they have a personal knowledge of him, it just reveals to us that unbelief is a personal thing. When the father says, Lord, I believe, with tears, he said, Lord, I believe. Lord, I've been to church. Lord, I've grown up in this thing. Lord, I've known about Jesus my whole life. Lord, my mama pray. Lord, my grandmama pray. Lord, my grandmama is a deacon at the church. Lord, my mama is on the usher board. Mama, Lord, my daddy is a trustee. Lord, my mama sing on the choir. I've been in church my whole life. I know who Jesus is. I know how to say hallelujah. I know the Holy Ghost. I know how to move. I know how to shout. I know. I get it. I know I got the faith. That's universal. The issue is, personally, I got some unbelief going on. Lord, I believe. Lord, I have faith. Lord, I know church. What I need help with is my unbelief. What you need help with is your unbelief. Overcoming your unbelief. Overcoming my, I got to overcome my unbelief. That if all we do is just continually teach you and reteach you and teach you and reteach you faith, that's nice. But if we're really going to get results in your life, we got to dig, we got to stick our hands down in this dirt. I, I can't get away from this root. We got to stick our hands down in this dirt and we got to figure out what's going on with your unbelief. How do I overcome my unbelief? How do I get you to overcome your unbelief? I have an answer for you. How, how do you overcome yours? I, I, the answer I have for you is how I overcome mine. The way that I overcome mine, because I have unbelief. I'm a faith preacher, but I have unbelief. I've been saved my whole life, but I have unbelief. Can I get a witness? I went to Rhema, but I have unbelief. My Lord, my God. I sat at the feet of Kenneth Hagin, but I still have unbelief. My God. I, 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 I've read every book on faith, and I still have unbelief. How do I overcome mine? That's Andy. How do I come overcome my unbelief? I don't know if you've ever heard a faith preacher talk about how they overcome their own personal unbelief. How do I overcome my unbelief? I can tell you right now, the secret to how I overcome my unbelief is the Word. <laughs> the Word is why we're here. It's why I'm trying as best I can, trying not to rush, but trying to establish some Word in you because the Word is how I overcome. When you look at someone like me or anyone that you may admire, I don't, I don't know if you know me well enough to admire my faith, but when you look at somebody like me or, or any of the great faith leaders, can I tell you the truth? It's not just that I have more faith, it's that I know more word. <laughs> it's not just that Creflo, it's not just that Fred Price, it's not just that Ted, that TDJ, it's not just that Joyce Ma, it's not whoever it is you look up to. It's not just that they have more faith than you. They don't just have a whole nother faith muscle they have than you have. The chances are the, re the reason why they're overcoming their personal unbelief and you're not overcoming yours is they just know more word than you do. How do I overcome my unbelief? Well, I, I just have more words. And so I want to spend my remaining 10 minutes on battling unbelief. Am I talking to anybody in here? Anybody hearing a word from the Lord yeah. around the world? Can you let us know? Saying, oh my God, this is a word for me. How can I overcome unbelief, battling unbelief? Now, now I'm, I'm going to minister to you as best I can, but keep in mind that, that at the start of it, battling unbelief right off the bat at the top. Before I start giving you points, my first kind of introductory point, and I don't even, it's not really a point, but just to start off, and that is that you have to get honest. <laughs> what is yours? You, ha you, have, you have to get honest. This is overcoming your 
unbelief. We can't focus so much on the unbelief as much as we have to focus on the word your. We got to get you to overcome your unbelief. You're going to have to be honest because faith is universal, but unbelief is personal. Unbelief is a personal thing. And so the start of it, number one, beloved, wherever you may be, around the world, what, what you're dealing with in Africa is totally different than what anybody's dealing with in Europe. It's the, they're not the same. Maybe the same virus, but different challenges. So uh, what, what, we, we're never going to get over the unbelief if we can't figure out what's yours. You're going to have to get honest with what is yours. Now, the way for me to try to minister something to you is to tell you mine. <laughs> now, I hope that you can relate to mine. I don't, I'm not saying mine like there's some kind of, um, well, this is the unbelief to have. I'm not saying that. I'm just telling you what mine is. And I, I'll tell you what my unbelief is. And maybe that may, maybe one of these, I think I'm going to give you three or four of them. And I can't give you all my unbelief or y'all won't want to go to this church no more. No, I, I'm going to give you three or four of them. Just be honest with you. But, but and maybe you can relate to them and they'll help you. But I, I mean, I don't know what yours are. You're going to have to get down to the bottom of what's yours. Your unbelief, what does it rest on? I think I'm going to give you a nugget or two that will help you and give you some direction. But I don't want to preach this like yours are automatically going to be mine. It may be possible that mine may be a little different than yours. But I'm at least going to be transparent and talk about what mine are. Well, what, what's my unbelief that I need the word to overcome? The first one is why I read Mark chapter 6. Because my first unbelief, personal unbelief that I have to overcome is what I call familiarity with the kingdom. Familiarity with the kingdom. It's possible. Be so familiar with church and so familiar with kingdom and so familiar with Jesus and so familiar with the things of God that you almost halfway don't believe nothing no more. It is possible to be so enchurched that you have lost faith in the power of it. My God. Some of us were just made to go too much. We was at every service. We, we was there every time it opened, and it just got old. And when somebody says, in Jesus' name, we almost don't feel the power of it. All, all we remember is our auntie saying, Jesus, 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 over our face and her breath wasn't all that fresh. We're so familiar with church that we almost, and we'll get around somebody that just got saved and see God moving in their life and have to get jealous over the move of God in their life because we're almost familiar. We've heard so many offerings taken up that we almost don't have faith to give. Whenever I take up an offering here, I'm always conscious of it. Last Sunday, when I took up the second offering, and I said, listen, and I gave a number. I don't like to give a number, but it's a good thing to do. Some, someone came up to me afterwards and was like, Pastor Andy, don't apologize for that. I mean, we need to know. You said 50. Okay, we'll try to give 50. You need to give a number. I said, you'll have to forgive me, but it's just that I've seen so many offerings taken up. My God, I've seen so many numbers, and I, I've seen so many folk come up with a number, and I've seen so many different lines that I just, I got to a point point in my own self where I barely had faith in it. It took unbelievers. It took somebody that barely knew God. It took somebody that was new to the kingdom to restore my faith in what it means to sow. My wife got saved at 19. She was raised buck heathen. My God, I could talk about her. She ain't here. Straight buck heathen. All right. She is a good girl. She go to church. Okay? They wasn't raised in church. Got saved in 19, going on 20. Her and I ended up getting together. And when we were engaged, about to get married, we were in a service. Okay? 
and there was a guest preacher there and he was preaching and he was taking up an offering he went down his thing and he was taking up an offering he was talking about how God was gonna move if you give God is gonna move on your behalf right now and I saw her grab for her reach for her checkbook to write a check out of the joint our little joint account money where we was saving up our little ducats and returning our little cans and she was writing a big old check off of that off of that thing and I looked at her I said what are you doing and she said did you hear what he just said it's going to happen if we give that this is going to take place didn't you just hear that he just said if we give sacrificially God will open up a window and bless us in a way that we don't have room enough and the Holy Ghost said to me what are you doing and I thought, oh my Lord and my God, I've heard so many offerings taken up that I'm just too familiar with kingdom. It's become a source of unbelief. The humanity of the servants in the kingdom, my God. I've, I've come across so much humanity of the people that are serving God. My Lord, my God. I done seen so many funky leaders, Jesus. I done seen so many attitude elders, my Lord, my God. I done seen so many, I done seen so many folk who supposedly knew God and didn't really know him. That familiarity with the kingdom, the humanity of the servants, folk I saw serving whose lives ended up being raggedy, it just ends up being a source of unbelief. I, I, know I'm, I'm, I know I'm touching on somebody's. I need a witness. It just ended up being a it ended up being an unbelief I had to battle. Every time somebody get up to take up an offering, I had to battle through that until I got to a place where I realized, no, 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 there's power in this. But, but for a while, it was unbelief. Bad theology. My Lord, my God. I've just, I've gotten some age on me now and I, I'm analyzing some of the things that they taught me that make no sense. And so now I realize that they think that way because of who they are and who they were raised by and not necessarily because that's what the word means. And all of that became a source of unbelief. It's why I read Mark chapter 6 because that's the situation. They're just too familiar with Jesus. They're just too familiar with church. They're too familiar with power. They're too familiar with it. They, who do you think you are? It's, some say Elijah. Some say Jeremiah. Some say one of the prophets. What about you? Who do you say that I am? Peter said, can I tell you the truth? You are something we ain't never seen before. You are the Christ. You are the Messiah. You are the son of the living God. You got power like we ain't never seen no kind of power before. You are a whole nother kind of animal, Jesus. You are a whole nother kind of beast. And the last thing I want to do is let my familiarity with kingdom kingdom slot you and compartmentalize you in a lane that is not what you really are you way bigger than that you way bigger than what they taught me you were you bigger than that but that familiarity with kingdom is a is a is an unbelief I have to battle. I know I'm not by myself. It's an unbelief I have to battle. I've just been to church too much. I've, I've been in every kind of church. I fell asleep with my face in the pew. And I and the choir came marching in. We marching to I, I just I've seen every I've seen every kind of church. I've been in every kind of service. I know all the hymns. And it's just almost so much that now it's become a it's almost an unbelief now that I had to battle. What's my second one? I'll give you my second one because I think that it's going to resonate with a lot of us. My second one is guilt. Guilt. I got guilt. I know I'm not the only one that's got guilt. I got guilt. I got guilt because there's two kinds of heathens that are watching me right now. There's heathen heathens, like what my wife was, hallelujah, like what Bruce was, no. There's heathen heathens, and then there's church heathens. Heathen heathens are folk who didn't know, didn't go to church, and was just out there wilding and nasty. My Lord, my God, and there's a whole lot of you watching. That's what you were. You was just straight buck heathens. 
folk are amazed that you're in church. They double, t they do a triple take. Do to meet, to meet, you work at a church. They can't believe they they're stunned that you are in the ministry. They can't believe it. That's how buck your heathen was. You coming out of something that's so wild that can't. You went to hillside. You go to church. They folk cannot believe you saved. You are you from heathen heathen. Then there's a whole lot of you like me. You a church heathen. You knew right. You knew what to do. You went to church. But you went from church to the party back to church, my God. You said, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray to love myself. You prayed every night before you went to bed. You went to the party and you they told you Jesus coming like a thief in the night. So you be in there popping that, and you go out and checking and then he cracked the sky. And you, because you knew better, but you still did dirt. My Lord and my God. For those people, it's almost worse. The enemy likes to come in and say, yeah, I mean, God's not going to do that for you because this is as a result of that. Because you did that, now you have this. The wages of sin is death, right? <laughs> so you reap what you sow, right? Well, there you go. You stuck with that. That's what you get. I deal with that. I know I'm not the only one. I deal with that. I be believing God for something. I be praying, talking to the Lord, and the enemy just comes in and be like, will you shut up and remind me <laughs> of stuff I did and folk I heard and, uh, and things I did wrong. I'd have gone back and apologized to people I call ex-girlfriends who I tapped and please forgive me. I, I was supposed to be righteous during my wild period and I didn't know what I was doing and I know I had you in the back of my van because the, because the devil will mess with you over stuff you did. I wish I had a witness in the building. You just feel guilty. That guilt bothers you. How do I overcome it? Let me give you a word. 2 Corinthians 5.17, real quick. I know I'm going over, guys, but it's okay. This is too good. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. They taught us that. We know that verse. They didn't teach us the rest of us. The rest of it, the old is gone, the new is here. Well, they taught us that. They didn't teach us verse 18. Verse 18 says, All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ. Here's the verse. Not counting people's sins against them. Woo! I came to tell somebody in here, God is not counting your sins. I came in here to tell you, the Lord don't care what you did. The Lord don't care who you hurt. The Lord don't care what mess you made. The Lord don't care about your abortion. The Lord don't care about what thing you did that you are so guilty of and you don't think you can ever forgive yourself. The only person that's holding you over that is you. Word says God casts your sin into a sea of forgetfulness and remembers them no more. I was praying one time about stuff I did when I was 18, when I was a little wild, Steve. I was talking to the Lord and the Lord interrupted me and said, Why are you talking to me about something that I don't remember? I said, my Lord, my God, I'm, instead of me speaking faith, I'm sitting here reminding God of something I did that he don't remember. He's not counting your sins against you. My God, I just freed somebody in here today. Now, somebody just got set free this morning. Uh, God's not counting your sins against you. Stop counting your sins against you because he's not. Number three, what's the third one? I got, I've given you two. Let me give you these last. I got the, the, my third one is the third unbelief that I battle is God can, but not for me. God can. I never doubt whether or not he can. That ain't the issue. I believe he absolutely can. And I, and I know they told me he's not a respecter of persons, but sometimes I just see favor on certain people. I, I just feel like I see favor on people, and I just start feeling like that's them, that's not me. And I, yeah, sure, God can, but he might. Yeah, the Lord can heal, but he ain't going to heal me. Yeah, the Lord can bless, but he's not going to bless me. Yeah, the Lord can make rich, but he ain't going to do it. Yeah, the Lord can get out of debt, but he ain't going to do it for me. He can but not for me. He can, but there's something about me that is 
I'm not going to get that. What he's done for others, he's not going to do for me. I have no doubt about whether or not God can, but will he? I battle that. That's an unbelief I have to battle. Let me give you the scripture that I use to help me. Matthew 7, verse 7. says, ask and it will be given. Hallelujah. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open. For everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. And the one who knocks, the door will be open. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are mortal, human, evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? God is a father. I'm his child. And since I don't really have to, for all of us that have children, we understand there's a way the Lord loves us and there's a way that God sees us that's just totally different. And I realize from the scriptures that God is a giver. I'm going to throw that on the screens for somebody. God is a giver. Let me help you with that. God is a giver. He gives generously to all without finding fault. God is not a respecter of persons. God is a giver. God hooks up. I don't know if you ever got a hookup. But I, it's how I overcome my unbelief. I expect to hook up. I don't know if you ever got a hookup. Back in the day when my boys used to work at McDonald's, man, I would take my girl to that McDonald's because my boys worked back there. I would take that girl there, and I would be like, is Brian working there? She'd be like, yeah. Then it'd be like, Brian Embry? I'm like, yeah, is Brian Embry working there? She'd let me let me see. She'd go in the back, come out. Uh, he looked through the grill. i will give him the nod like this. He nod back. That means hook me up. That means I'm going to order a nine-piece nugget, but I need you to stuff about 15 nuggets in there. I, I need you to hook me up. Oh, y'all was robbing McDonald's. Yes, we were. Pray for us. I need the hookup. Anybody believe in God for a hookup? I'm, I believe in God for God to do something for me just because he loved me, just because he liked me, just because he know my name. The hookup. It reminds me of when I, when I moved to North Carolina, when I came here from Oklahoma, and I moved here with a group of dudes. It was me, it was Colin, it was a bunch of us, Earl, there's a bunch of us. We all moved down here together, James, to start World Overcomers. We all loaded all of our stuff in one moving truck. We loaded up this one moving truck. Remember that? We loaded up this one moving truck, and we figured when we get there from Oklahoma, when we get in there, we're going to drive around and unload everybody's stuff at everybody's apartment, and we're going to be good. We were supposed to return that truck on Friday, but we just decided, hey, we'll just keep it till Monday. We'll use it for uh, somebody going to have to buy some furniture, and we'll use it for that, and we'll just be able to move around stuff. And so finally, we're on our way to take it back to return the truck, and I'm sitting in the driver's seat, Colin driving it. I'm sitting in the driver's seat, and I'm reading through the contract, and I noticed that we could keep the truck as long as we wanted, but the problem was we only had a certain amount of miles that we were allowed to put on the truck. And once we went over a certain amount of miles, they were going to charge us 25 cents a mile. And we had gone way over these miles. I mean, we we had a bill that was like $350, $400, $500, something like that, but money we didn't have. We drive, we about to take this truck back, and we're going to have a $500 bill that we don't. I don't have no money. Colin Jamaican, he ain't got, I ain't got no money. We, we ain't got no car to put it on. We ain't got no deposit. We ain't got a part of it. We thinking how are we go. We thought all kinds of stuff. Why don't we just leave the truck there and run away? Why don't we just why don't we set the truck on fire? Somebody stole it. We went all kinds of stuff ran through our head. Finally, we like okay, we just gotta take this truck back. So we take the truck back when we were hoping maybe the guy won't see it. Maybe he won't notice. We take the truck back. I go in with the contract. I give the guy the contract. He looks at the he looks at it. And he sees, uh, and then he's, he's looking at it, and, he, uh, and I'm, just, I'm just sitting there saying, blah, 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 blah. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to curse him with blindness like I'm Elisha. Blind him. I don't want him to see. In the contract, we owe $500. Finally, he goes, he go, oh, yeah, yeah. I saw his face frown up. I said, oh, I'm in some trouble. And then and he, da, 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 and he looked up, and he said, he said, yeah. He said, yeah, man, you owe. That's what he said. Yeah, man, you owe. He hadn't said anything before that. 
I said, I owe. He said, yeah, man, you're old. 513. When he said 513, I said, okay, I'll be right back. I said, oh, I'll be right back. I, I looked out. I said, I'm motion. Colin came in. When Colin came in, he said, what, what's the problem, man? I said, man, he said, we owe. He said, y'all yeah, owe. And Colin said, man, we owe. And then they, Colin said, man, where you from? He said, Trinidad. Oh, my mommy's Trinity. Trini, Trinidad. I just stepped back and let the West Indians talk to each other. I kept my mouth shut. And before you know it, yeah, man, one time, two times, what you going to do? Man, what you going to Colin said, man, what you going to do about this thing, man? Oh, man, don't worry about no charge, man. And we walked out of there with no bill because West Indians hooked each other up. Can I get a witness in the building? Anybody believe in God for a hookup? Anybody believe in God that God can put favor on your situation my God's a giver my God's a giver then my fourth one and I'm done I'm gone way over but it's good my fourth one and I'm done my fourth one my fourth unbelief is and you'll have to pray for me and I'm gonna pray for you but my patience wears thin time wears me out <laughs> my patience wears thin time wears me out I wanted to say I was impatient but Truthfully, I am patient because there's been some stuff that I've been waiting for for a minute. I wish I had a witness. There's some stuff I've been waiting for for a minute. I got more patience than I thought, but my patience is wearing thin. And time is wearing me out. I'm getting tired of waiting on this thing. I've been believing God for this thing, and it's getting old, and my patience is wearing thin, and this time is wearing me out. I got a passage of scripture for you. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. It says, but as surely as God is faithful, our message to you is not yes and no. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, by me and Silas and Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him it has always been yes. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God the Father. You know what this passage means? It means that God has already said yes, and your yes is locked in time. <laughs> Hallelujah. Your yes is locked in time. It's not the Lord has said no, he said yes. It's just the yes is locked in a destiny. The yes is locked in a future. And your job is to say amen. My job is just to say amen until I get there. My job is to just keep saying amen, so let it be. Yeah, yet the Lord has already said yes. It's just simply a matter of me saying amen till I get to the yes. My, wish, my patience may be wearing thin and time may be wearing me out, but I got to say amen. Can you say amen? My heart says amen to your will, Lord. My heart says, though I bow low in humble submission, and my heart says amen. Can you say amen till you get to that place that God has for you? My prayer is that the Lord will fill us with himself. That not only will we have belief, faith, but that we'll be over, able to overcome our unbelief. Bow your head, let me pray for you. Now, Lord, I thank you. Thank you, Lord God, for what you said to us today. Thank you. Thank you for your word that's so true. Thank you that it's a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our pathway. Thank you that the entrance of your word sheds light. And as we walk in that light, we have fellowship with one another, and there's a power that comes on us. Thank you for speaking so big through us. Thank you for the speaking to us and through us. Thank you for being so big in us today. Thank you for a word able to save our souls and build us up. We magnify your name, the name of Jesus, the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, let knees bow and tongues confess that you are Lord. Thank you, Lord God, for your power that's available to us. And I stretch my hand to the camera and to every house and every person. God, I'm praying right now for favor on us. Thank you that our yes is locked in time. 
And it's just simply a matter of us saying amen till we get through this situation. We glorify your name. Have your way in us even now. In Jesus' name, we all said together, amen. Can I get you to give to the work of the kingdom of God? Can I get you to sow a seed in faith? I know that we were talking about building fun, and we still do have building stuff that we're doing, but right now I've been preaching on faith, and I'm just trying to get folk to sow a seed in faith. I, 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 if y'all were here, I'd say, oh, we'd all stand, and I, I'd pray for everybody's belief and pray for everybody's unbelief and, and lay hands on everybody, and I'm praying right now against your unbelief, but can we take a step of faith right now? Let's sow a seed into the work of the kingdom of God. If I never taught you that before, can I teach it to you now that you respond to a word with a seed. Can you do that? If there's ever a time to respond to a word with a seed, it's now. And so this this our second offering. I know and then right now, seven seven if if you just seven seven nine seven seven push pay woe online to 77977. Can I challenge you? At least $50. I know I've, I said that last Sunday and I apologize for it. I'm not going to apologize in it for any, any anymore. Well, well, PA, what would you expect? What do you think is a good seed for me to sow? At least $50. Unless $50 ain't no money to you. If you're somebody that $50 is $5, then you need to sow more than $50. But if, if 50, $50 is a good place to start, and you're, for you to say, I, all right, I have faith. Let me sow a seed of faith into the work of the kingdom of God and expect the harvest. Expect God to turn this thing around. Expect God to move by his spirit. Will you give? I know there are some of you that are watching. You're brand new, familiar to World Overcomers. But something jumped in you. you. You felt a quickening of the Holy Ghost. You felt the presence of the Lord. Surely it's in this place. We're believing that it's in your life. A part of the way that you connect yourself to that word is by prayer and praise and by you watching. But also you hook a seed into that word and you pull it to yourself. And we're believing God's best for you. But now it's up to you. Do you walk in it? Do you speak it? Do you believe it? Will you give to it? Will you sow to it? I sow into a word so that I can manifest it in my life. And I'm a living witness. I know I'm not the only one. I'm a living witness of words I've sowed into. It may have taken a bit of time for me to get the harvest, but I'm getting the harvest. I'm walking in the harvest. And I'm believing God for a miracle in your life. And so, and especially if you're believing God for a miracle. Especially if you're believing God for something big. Especially you're about to make a big investment. You're about to make a big... This is a moment for you to throw a seed out there before... That seed of faith, it never leaves your life. It goes into your future. It goes into your destiny. Come on, let's pray. I'm not going to beg you. Lord, I want to thank you for the opportunity that we have. You said that each one should give as they've decided in their heart to give, not reluctantly, not under compulsion. But, Lord, you love a cheerful giver. And so, God, we praise you even now for the opportunity that we have to give to your kingdom. And I pray that you multiply this seed and multiply the sower. Thank you, God, not just for the seed but for the sower. Multiply the sower, not just the seed. We ask you, God, to multiply the seed, Lord, supernaturally. Make stuff happen. Give us favor. Thank you for the favor that's already on us. But thank you, God, for even more favor. But God, not just the seed, but the sower. Every person, Lord God, that is giving right now, Lord, I pray for power to fall on them. For you to multiply them and expand them and enlarge their territory. I pray for things that we could not imagine to happen. We'll give you praise for what you do and say. You're worthy. In Jesus' name, we all said together, amen. God bless you as you give. And uh, we'll be back here Wednesday night. We've got a live service, 7. And it's Wednesday night, 7 to 8.30, 90 minutes. Sometimes it's a little bit over. And uh, listen, you can join in with us. It's a live worship service. And uh, this service here, we're going to have it again at 11.30. So it's not too late for you to let somebody know, my God, there was a word, Pastor Andy, the worship was amazing, and we had a word. Share this. It's easier than ever to share your faith with somebody, especially somebody that you know is at home, somebody that can't go nowhere. It, there, there's always been the, the issue of, oh, well, if folks don't go to church because they're doing so many other things, but right now they're home. And so you can, you can easily share this and say to someone, you've got to watch you, the, the, it was a word on overcoming your unbelief, especially someone you know that's been wrestling with their faith. And uh, sharing your faith is so powerful. 
And there's such a time for us to do it, especially with people that don't know the Lord. And uh, this was an anointed service, and we're about to do it again in about 45 minutes. And it's going to be powerful. And so we want you to join with us. And uh, we're glad you were with us. Come on, let's, let's pray one more time. Lord, I, I would say dismiss us from this place, but never from your presence. God, where, wherever we may be, thank you that we're in your presence. We pray that you'd cover us. We pray that you'd watch over us. We pray that you'd protect us. We pray that you would heal us. Lord, we pray that you would heal everyone that's connected to us. Lord, thank you for Jarrell. Right now, we call his name to you. Thank you, Lord God, that you are a healing God. Thank you that you can make a way where there seems to be no way. Thank you, Lord God, that your hand is on us for good. Thank you for every person that called in today, every person that sent in a text today, everyone that has a prayer request, every single solitary person that has COVID or has a loved one that has it, and not just COVID, God, but cancer and every kind of sickness and disease. God, we're praying as you heal one, heal all. Your name heals all. Your name delivers all. It works. Have your way in us till we come back together again. In Jesus' name, we all sit together. Amen. God bless you. See you next time.